All right, guys, good morning. This video is gonna be a as comprehensive, anyhow, of, of a, a informational, um, I guess, treatise uh, about the Trinity. And I thought about piecing it together myself, which I'm sure I could just because there is a good amount of evidence and I am very familiar with it, but nobody puts it better than Dr. Robert Luganbill of uh, ichthyus.com, I-C-H-T-H-Y-S.com. I got this from uh, his theology lesson in the Bible Basics, and it is far and away, or far and away rather, the most, again, comprehensive, succinct, and wonderful explanation I've ever seen in my life. It helped me out greatly many years ago, and I think it hopefully will help you too. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about the persons of God, the Trinity. A, the definition of the Trinity, God is one in essence, three in persons. Revelation 4, 8, holy, 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 three times over. The Lord God, the Almighty, he who was, he who is, and he who is coming. No specific term for the triune nature of God occurs in the Bible. The inspired writers of the New Testament clearly felt that the existence of God in three distinct persons, the doctrine which we now call the Trinity, was a relatively straightforward concept and accessible enough, even with the cursory reading from Scripture, from passages such as the one we just quoted. They're holy, 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 one for each person. As apostolic fathers, the generation that followed the men that actually penned the New Testament also felt that merely quoting scripture was an entirely adequate way of discussing the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not until the late 2nd, early 3rd centuries did the term Trinity itself come into general use as a way of defending against a variety of heresies which sought to deny various aspects of the unique, unique triune nature of God. What earlier generations of Christians had taken completely for granted based upon their common sense approach to reading the Bible, that God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are all God and that they are at the same time and that at the same time they are in what we may call a personal way each one also distinct from each other God is one God is also three and there is no contradiction between these statements the simplest the best and most traditional definition of the Trinity is that God is one in essence and three in person to put the doctrine in complete terms the Father is God the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God Yet at the same time, the Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit, the Son is not the Father or the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. We can better understand what the Trinity is by first considering what it is not in terms of definition given above. In other words, one in essence, three in persons. So, one. God is one in essence, but that does not mean that only one person of the Trinity is deity, God. God is three in person, and all three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are divine. Heresies of the past which have challenged the divinity of the members of the Trinity include adoptionism, asserting that Christ is the Son of God only in a sense of adoption, nonsense, the Ebionite heresy, teaching that Christ had only a human nature empowered by God's Spirit, and Unitarianism, which asserts a uni, a uni, personal, uni personality of God, denying the deity of Christ and the Holy Spirit. But the Bible teaches that there are three members that the three members of the Trinity are deity. See Isaiah 63, 9 through 14, Matthew 3, 16 through 17, 28, 19, John 14, 16 through 17, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, 1 Peter 1, 1, 1 through 1 and 2, and Revelation 1, 4 through 6. A. The Father is God. Matthew 6, 9, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Ephesians 3, 14 through 15. I'm always reading these 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 uh, verses off, by the way, so that you personally can go verify because I am not the source of truth. The Word of God is. Please remember that. I am the Alpha. Here's Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord who is God. He who is and was and is coming, the Almighty. B. The Son of God. John 5.18, 10.30, Romans 9.5, 1 Corinthians 8.6, Colossians 2.9, Hebrew, Hebrews 1.3. The word, uh, this is John 1, 1 through 2. The word existed in the beginning. The word was both present with the Father, before creation in other words, and the word was God in his own right. This same one was present with the Father God in the beginning. By the way, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses butcher this. They intentionally had to change their Bible specifically to twist the words of the Bible because they refused to accept the deity of Christ. They think he's an angel. Michael the archangel of all things. Absolute insanity. C. The Holy Spirit is God. Genesis 1, 2. Psalm 139, 7. Acts 5, 3 through 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, and then compare Hebrew 3, Hebrews rather, 3, 7 through 11 with Psalm 95, 7 through 11, where the Lord is speaking. Now this, now the Lord, um, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. Uh, the Lord, generally speaking, is always referring back to the Old Testament name of God, Yahweh. Yahweh refers to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
2. God is one in essence, but that does not mean that the Trinity is only one person, merely displaying three modes or aspects of himself. God is three in person, and all three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are distinct persons rather than manifestations of a single multifaceted person. Heresies of the past which have challenged the distinct personalities of the members of the Trinity include modalism, the idea that Christ and the Spirit are mere modes of the Father's personality, and I think this is do docetism, or docetism, the notion that Christ only seemed real and was in reality merely a phantom of sorts representing the Father's plan. But the Bible teaches that all three members of the Trinity are distinct persons. A. The Father is a unique person in his own right, for he is distinct from the Son. Daniel 7.13, for example, I was looking during my vision of the night, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming up, and he approached the Ancient of Days. In other words, the Father. And they brought him before him. B. The Son is a unique person in his own right, for he is distinct from the Father. Hebrews 10, 7. Behold, I have arrived. In the, in the scroll of your book is written about me to do your will, O my God. So the Son calls the Father, O my God. C. The Holy Spirit is a unique person in his own right, for he acts as a distinct person. Romans 8, 26. And the Spirit helps us in our weakness in a similar way, for we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us also with anguish supplications which words cannot express it speaks for us even when we don't know what he's saying and how he's saying it because it's always for our own good because he is god always working out all things for our good just as roman said god is three in person but that does not mean that there is any inferiority or disparity of status activity or substance between the members of the trinity as would inevitably be the case in any human association God is one in essence, and all three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-substantial partners in one and the same essence. Heresies of the past, which have challenged the co-equality of the members of the Trinity, include subordinationism, which alternatively asserts that either Christ or the Spirit is by nature inferior to the Father, nonsense, and Arianism, which teaches a Christ not entirely equal in divinity to the Father. So it's just, just, just below the Father, which is nonsense again. But the Bible teaches that all three members of the Trinity are co-equal partakers of the same essence. A. They possess a full and equal share of the status of deity, as seen from the equal rank accorded to each in the formula for professional... Prof, for, 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 ah, excuse me, for profession of faith at baptism. Matthew 28, 19 through 20a. Then Jesus came over and said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, so go and make all nations my followers by baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. B. They possess, all, uh, they possess a full and equal share of the eternal function of deity as seen from their joint participation and union. And check this out. Everybody sees this, but they don't really understand. They like to claim that this is God talking to the angels. This is nonsense. Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our pattern. See, they possess, see my video on the image of God, by the way. I try to do my best there. I think I did okay. See, they possess a full and equal share of, a, of the substance of deity as seen from the attribution of goodness to all three members in the apostolic benediction of 2 Corinthians where grace, the policy of the goodness of God, love, the natural consequence or emanation of the goodness of God, and fellowship, the ultimate result of the goodness of God, are attributed to the, the Son, Father, and Holy Spirit respectively. 2 Corinthians 13.14 May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 4. God is three in person, but that does not mean that the Trinity is composed of three or more different gods, as, again, JWs, Mormonism, all this other nonsense. They're all following these silly ideas. God is one in essence. Uh, God is one in essence, and all three members of the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, are the sole joint partakers of that same essence rather than three similar beings of similar essence. All so-called Christian sects, which elevate saints and angels to the status of divi divinity, essentially belong to this heretical category. After the manner of pagan pantheons, which also possess numerous deities of lesser and greater rank. All, all the ancient uh, pagan religions. But the Bible teaches that all three members of the Trinity alone share the same unique essence. A. The Father is revealed to be uniquely God. Deuteronomy 4.35 You were shown these things so as to know that the Lord, He is God, and there is no other beside Him. B. The Son and the Father are revealed to be uniquely God. John 10.30 I and the Father are one. That, that right there. He's claiming to be God. He cannot... He would be an absolute liar and blasphemer and absolutely deserve His death if that was the case. But He absolutely wasn't because He was the perfect God. 
C. The Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father are revealed to be uniquely God. John 14, 16 through 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, for it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he abides with you and will be in you. B. The Trinity in the Bible. The definition of the Trinity, which does, best does justice to the biblical statements on the subject, is one given above, namely that God is one in essence and three in person. We get an even clearer picture of what the Bible has to say about the Trinity when we combine this traditional definition with the four corollaries discussed and documented immediately above that we just talked about. A. All three members of the Trinity are divine persons. B. All three members of the Trinity are unique persons. C. All three members of the Trinity have co-equal and co-eternal essence. D. All three members of the Trinity share the same divine essence. As can be seen from the above numerous heresies we just discussed that have sprung up to challenge orthodox statements about the Trinity, the doctrine can be a difficult one to state in a proper biblical way. This is especially true the further any definition of the Trinity moves away from the actual statements contained in the Bible, which, as we mentioned above, were felt to be sufficient by the apostolic the apostles, rather, and the apostolic fathers, the ones that came right after them. It should be noted here that even in terms of, in the terms essence and person, were felt by some theologians of the early church to be controversial. We may talk of man's essence, we are all cut from the same spiritual cloth, and man's personality, we are all unique individuals, the image and likeness of God, but the essence of God is different from the essence of man. For one thing, all members of the Trinity share the same divine essence. And the idea of personality in the Trinity is different from that of human persons. To take but one example, the absolute unity of agreement and purpose of the Trinity throughout all eternity is not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively beyond human experience. There's no way humans could ever act in accordance uh, the same way that the Trinity does because they are God. The lesson here is that rationalistic speculation, always dangerous when expounding the Bible, is even more to be avoided in the case of the Trinity, a doctrine that was once that was only fully revealed with the arrival of the New Testament. What God has chosen to reveal about the doc doctrine, he has revealed carefully and gradually. The subject of the Trinity in the Old Testament is covered below. We're going to go over that. But it may be said here that a large part of the reason for this guarded revelation of the doctrine beyond our human limitation to comprehend it may be the all too obvious fact see the discussion above above that wrong ideas about the nature of the trinity have historically posed such a dire threat to the entire basis of our christian faith just a little even in the loaf and satan can make the trinity to be an association of gods and no different from paganism or one god with three hats thus completely eliminating the importance the importance and efficacy of Christ's incarnation and sacrifice. He had to be God, guys. In, lo in his loving wisdom, God has told us what we most need to know of, without giving us either information that could be misinterpreted or less than accurate illustrations that might do more harm than good. Two, illustrating the Trinity. I'm going to show you this picture here in just a second. As we have just stated, attempting to illustrate such a carefully protected doctrine as the Trinity has the potential for doing more harm than good. The fundamental problem with the illustrations of the type considered below is that they all necessarily contain potentially dangerous and untrue points of comparison which, if too much stress is placed upon them, run the real risk of leading to heretical conclusions, a danger that far outweighs any good they may do in attempting to shed some light on the subject. The number of objections to such illustrations is that, God is, that, is that God is divine, and since nothing and no one else is, any illustra illustration will, need, will needs be imperfect and inaccurate, a fact, that may, a fact which may well explain why no such illustrations occur in the Bible. See Isaiah 40:18. And there is more. Historically, Satan attacks on the doctrine of the Trinity, a teaching crucial to the integrity of our Christian faith, have focused on the threefold sovereign personality of God and or his deity in three persons. But this reality of divine triune personality is precisely the point that all illustrations of the Trinity miss of necessity since there is nothing like the Trinity because God is unlike anything on this earth. A. An illustration from the early church, the Trinity Triangle. This oldest of Trinity illustrations is also in many ways the best because the non-doctrinal point of comparison, in other words, the triangle, merely serves to organize visually the meaning imparted by the words. All three members of the Trinity are God, one in essence, yet they are distinct They are distinct from each other, three in person. I'm going to show you this. This is not perfect, but it is close as it gets, guys. Pause and take a look. Okay. B. The illustration of the family of man. Like the Trinity, mankind has multiple members, all possessive, 
all possessed of similar spiritual essence, but the Trinity share a unique divine essence. And their triune unanimity of purpose is unlike anything in the realm of humanity. Not even close. C. The illustration of the human mind. Like the Trinity, the mind can be said to be at once one thing, yet at the same time several things, intellect, emotion, conscious, etc., and can dialogue with itself and even be at cross purposes with itself. But the Trinity is composed of distinct divine personalities to which the inner workings of our psyches make a poor comparison. Very, very weak. D. Illustrations from the world of nature. There are many things in nature that would cons consist of distinct multiple parts that are at the same time con that at the same time constitute one complete whole. For example, distinguishable distinguishable branches, roots, and trunk are all part of one and the same tree. A and eggs have three distinct parts: yolk, white, and shell. With without any of which three, you would no longer have an egg. None of the illustrations of this sort really help to explain the unique personality of the Trinity and their shared divine essence. Again, weak explanations, though somewhat alike. E. Illustrations from the physical realm. This category of illustration contains some of the more interesting examples that have been used to explain the Trinity, though they all suffer from the same objections that were lodged against the former category. For example, light is one yet distinct. See 1 John 1 5. Radio is heard. Visible light is seen, infrared, is, infrared light is felt. All three are light. Uh, the universe is one yet distinct. Time, space, and matter. Time is one yet distinct. Past, present, and future. Space is one yet distinct. Length, breadth, and height. Matter is one yet distinct. Energy, matter, phenomena. The most that can be said for the best of these illustrations is that to the extent that they remind us of the awesome wisdom and, and power of God in creating these complex, wonderful things, often to be taken for granted, often taken for granted, they may also help us realize that the maker is likely to be even more complex and wonderful and so accept what we know to be true about the Trinity, one in essence, three in person, even if it seems too complex and wonderful to fully grasp. As we have said, however, care must be taken to see that none of these illustrations is taken too far, lest by attempting to understand beyond what is written, we be led instead into dangerous and extra-biblical rationalizations based upon these loose analogies. They are all loose. They are not, they are not tight. For the Trinity is often a good litmus test for a Christian faith. To accept it, one must accept not only the existence of God, but the distinctness and divinity of Jesus Christ, the true touchstone principle, principle that divides believers from unbelievers. Uh, 1 John 2, 22 through 23. By distorting our understanding of the Trinity, the devil ultimately seeks to destroy our faith in Jesus Christ, the real focal point and rationale for satanic attacks that seek to confuse the issue of one in essence, three in person. Again, see all the crazy religions that just twist his name and his existence. Three, the roles in the Trinity and the plan of God. A more valuable approach than the, non, than the use of non-biblical illustration to understand the nature of the Trinity is the examination of, of the function of the Trinity as described in the Bible. The scriptures have much to say about how God works in human history and specific to our topic, what roles the individual members of the Trinity play in that work, otherwise known as the plan of God. A. Introduction. God has not been operating in human history or on an ad hoc or reactive basis, but has been working everything together for good. Romans 8.28. Since the moment of creation, the plan of God will be discussed as a topic in its own right in part 2B of this series, Eschatology. I'll likely get to that here pretty quick. But it will be helpful at this point to consider excuse me, the unique roles played by the individual members of the Trinity in executing the plan, that plan in time. For by doing so, we shall gain biblical insight into the true nature of the Trinity. B. The names of the Trinity. Much can be understood about the Trinity through the consideration of the names by which they are revealed. Collectively, the Trinity refer to themselves as God. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, translated in the New World Testament, in the New Testament rather, by the common Greek word for God, Theos, is technically a plural of the original meaning, Mighty One. Collectively, then, the Trinity shared this appellation, pluralized to express additional majesty. Individually considered, however, members of the Trinity in the Old Testament are referred to the most commonly, to most commonly by the Hebrew word Yahweh, translated in the New Testament by the common Greek word for Lord, Kyrios. A word that, as we have seen, calls special attention to the Lord's timeless and dynamic being. See the section we just went over. Um, th these two names, God and Lord, emphasize respectively the unity of the Trinity in its threefold persons. Elohim is a, is a plural, but refers to the Trinity collectively, and the joint divine essence of all three individual members. Yahweh is singular, but can be used to refer to any of the Trinity's, indivi Trinity's members individually. 
With the fuller revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament following the revelation and advent of Jesus Christ, the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit give us an even clearer understanding of the roles of the Trinity, and therefore the Trinity itself. The Father, the first person of the Trinity. Origin. The term for the, an idea of the fatherhood of God, a designation well known from the New Testament, is also found in the Old Testament from the Pentateuch onward. The word Father is first used for God in Deuteronomy 32.6. Is he not your father, the one who bought you? He is the one who made you and established you. Later in verse 18 of the same chapter, God is referred to as the rock who fathered you. The concept of the fatherhood of God can also be seen in Exodus 4.22, where Israel is referred to as God's firstborn son. Significance. The use of the name father is clearly intended to be taken as an analogy from human experience. Like the father who sired us, he is the creator. Like a father, he is our authority figure, our trainer, disciplinarian, and teacher. See Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And not to be underestimated, he is the one who cares for us and loves us deeply, who protects us, keeps us safe, and wants only what is truly best for us, regardless of what we see as best. Being human, our earthly fathers had strengths and weaknesses and despite their best intentions had to act on the basis of imperfect, imperfect information about what was best for us. But our heavenly father represents the perfect ideal, ideal of fatherhood. He acts towards us always in perfect love and all he does for us is without question for our ultimate good. For whether he disciplines us or blesses, blesses us, he does so in perfect knowledge of who we are and of all that is in our hearts person. The Father is often referred to as the first person of the Trinity, the authoritative I person, because he speaks to us as I, directly, manifest, directly manifesting his authoritative will as our God, creator, and ruler of the universe. Uh, see Exodus three fourteen through 15, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, for an example. The Son, the second person of the Trinity, origin, along with the holy angels, see Job 38, 7, not the NIV, by the way, that makes it confusing. We believers are all sons of God. Romans 8.14, Galatians 3.26, 4.5, see also John 1.12 and 1 John 3.1-2. 1 1 the widespread franchise of sonship is based upon the paternal position of the Father relative to all his obedient creatures, but there is only one, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Through Christ's incarnation, though Christ's incarnation was in a veiled fashion prophesied and foreshadowed by ritual sacrifice, it remained in the Old Testament times very much a mystery until the time of his actual first advent. Now it stands clearly revealed that the archetypal Son of God is our Lord Jesus Christ and that the Old Testament parallels are types that look forward to this revelation. In other words, Adam is the Son of God, Luke 3.38. Christ is the preeminent last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15.45, and the Son of Man. Uh, I, in other words, Kadam, uh, of Daniel seven thirteen through fourteen, as well as in the New Testament usage, Israel is the servant of God. Isaiah forty two eighteen, Christ is the suffering servant who will take away the sins of the world. Isaiah forty two one fifty two thirteen fifty three twelve, Israel is God is God's son. Christ is the son. Uh, see Hosea eleven eleven one fulfilled at Matthew two fifteen. Finally. Though Solomon was David's direct descendant, Christ is his ultimate descendant, the Messiah, the Son of David, who is the Son of God. Psalm 2, 7-12, through 12, also 1, 10, 1. Significance. Building on the idea of fatherhood as discussed above, sonship denotes the idea of a special and unbreakable relationship with the Father, one of dutiful subordination to the Father's will, but also one of special privilege, inheritance, and shared authority. A son, especially a king's son, is often more accessible to the, than the Father. The role of a mediator... The role of mediator between the king and his offending subjects can only be played by someone who is on par with both father, king, and creature. Subjects, only a son incarnate, can be sent on such a mission of reconciliation. See Matthew 21, 33 through 40. Person, the son is often referred to as the second person. In other words, the accessible you person, because he is accessible to us, having appeared in the flesh to forge a relationship with us on the father's behalf. See John 15, 14 through 15. And having gained access to the Father for us, John fourteen six, Ephesians two eighteen, also three twelve, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, origin from the first chapter of the Old Testament, Genesis one two, to the closing chapter of the New Testament, Revelations twenty two seventeen, the word spirit is used to refer to God the Holy Spirit. The Hebrew and Greek words for spirit, ruach and pneuma, uh, respectively, have the core meaning of wind or breeze. And again, there are important points to be garnered from this name analogy. Significance. The wind is a potent, invisible force. Though we perceive it and experience its effects, we can neither see where it comes from or where it is going. John 3, 8. It, it can have everything from a gentle, warming influence to a powerful, chilling effect. 
wind is thus aptly describing is aptly descriptive analogy for the Holy Spirit's role in the power in the plan of God, his invisible yet powerful support of good. Zechariah 4 6, 1 Corinthians 12 3, and restraint of evil. Genesis 6 3, 1 Corinthians 12 3, 2 Thessalonians 2 5 through 8, is the f furtherance of the plan of God and must is the fur in the furtherance of, plan of, of the plan of God must not be underestimated. Person. The Holy Spirit is often referred to as the third person of the Trinity, the unseen He person, because unlike the Father, He does not speak directly to us. And unlike the Son, he has not been made manifest to us. Instead, like the wind, he is unseen by us. But like the wind, that does not mean we do not experience his power in a very real and personal dynamic way. John fourteen sixteen through 17, Galatians five twenty two through 26. And here's a note. As should be clear from the discussion above, the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are thus representative of the Trinity's individual roles in the plan of God for mankind and have been given to us to help us understand the relationship and functions of these three divine personalities in that plan. The names themselves must not be pushed beyond the clearly intended analogies to our human frame of reference as outlined above. This is no small caveat, for it is largely on the basis of the title Son that heresies of the past have sought to deny the full and equal divinity of Christ. In other words, casting him as subordinate in essence to the Father as hyper-Arianism does. The case of such the case of the Spirit shows how wrong-headed such analysis based solely on these titles are, for the Spirit is not at all inanimate or impersonal, even though wind is a fitting description of his invisible yet powerful role in our Christian lives. He acts in a very personal, personal way towards us and towards the other members of the Trinity. John 3, 5, 14, 16 through 7, 14, 26, 15, 26, 16, 8 through 15, Acts 5, 3, 5, 9, 13, 2, 16, 6 through 10, Romans 8, 26, 1 Corinthians 2, 10, Revelation 2, 7. As our comforter and encourager, the relationship of leadership, as our comforter and encourager, forgive me, John 14, 16, 16, 7, the relationship of leadership, Romans 8, 4, Galatians 5, 16 and 18, encouragement, John 14, 16, 16, 7, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7, and empowerment, Luke 24, 49, Romans 15, 13, we receive from the Holy Spirit, uh, we receive some from the Holy Spirit are some of the most personal and animating relationships we shall experience this side of heaven. I'm going to cut it off right there because the video is already running long. We are going to continue on with the Trinity roles as seen from specific New Testament scriptures in the next video. Uh, subscribe, buttons, bells, YouTube hates us, make a comment. I hope this is helping you guys. Please remember to see part two because it will fill out the rest of the information not addressed in part one. Bless you. Talk to you soon.